Hey, it's Nick. We've got a good episode this week talking about the new era of social media. I think you all enjoy it. Um, no sponsor, but I did want to give a call out for ideas and questions. This is our last episode before our 100th episode. So we're going to have a good kind of celebration podcast next podcast. So if you have any questions or thoughts or just, you know, a words of congratulations, send it in to minor details podcast at gmail.com. Also, you guys know the deal. Like, subscribe, follow, give us five stars, all the platforms. You know, I know you probably only listen on one platform, but do it on all the platforms. It helps us out. And yeah, let's hit the amazing intro and outro by Kyoshi the Kid. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two designers in the big city. So wet in the small stuff. Whoosh. How you been, James? I'm good. How are you? Good, man. Good, man. You been up to anything? Just uh, nose of the grindstone at work. Yeah. Obviously, I can't say anything, but um, yeah, grindstones and noses, it's a, it's a rough life. <laughs> um, I went to uh, Storm King. You went to Storm King. Yeah. It's a fun experience. A romantic venture. <laughs> no, I wish, man. <laughs> My, you know, dating in New York's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean that it's romantic and that it's Storm King. Like, it's a, it doesn't, doesn't have to be with, a, with somebody else to be romantic, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was <laughs> Oh, romantic is in, like, poetic. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Romantic in the design sense. Yeah, exactly. Oh, for sure. It was fall. I mean, it is fall. Yeah. And uh, we we hit it. I went my, with my friend Aaron and Henry. My friends Aaron and Henry. They're one person. <laughs> my friend Aaron. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we hit the perfect day. It was like 65 degrees out. The All the trees were this golden yellow mm. and this, you know, vibrant red. Romance. Um, That's what I'm talking about. And I guess for those who aren't familiar with Storm King, it was a, it's a pretty well-known sculpture, outdoor sculpture. Yeah. Park? I think Museum? they I think if anybody has seen the second season of Master of None, I'm pretty sure there's an episode where they go to Storm King. You know, that's one show I have. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I have found I don't, one relevant <laughs> pop culture. Although I don't know if I've seen I didn't know they had multiple seasons. Yeah, there's two seasons. Oh, maybe I have Did seen you only one. watch the one or the second one? I honestly can't was remember. the was there a plot line with an Italian girl or was it with an American girl? Oh, I think it was Italian. Okay. So you went, st- skip straight into the second season. Like oh, the, well then like I must the have cultural. <laughs> no, if I saw Ignoramus that Ignoramus you are. No, I would, I'm sure I would have seen the first season. I if, guess so. Oh man. Who knows? Um, I don't know that it's, a, it's not necessarily a show that you'd have to see the first season to appreciate the second season. Right. But yeah, they do go to Storm King in that season uh, in one of the episodes. It's a good show. Yeah. It's very New York New York uh, vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, that was fun. Yeah. Have you ever been? No. I've only I've only been as far as Beacon. Yeah. Um, Beacon's St- a great museum, too. Storm King, you kind of like need a car to get there. Right, right. Which is... Which you do have now. We, we do have it now. Yeah, we should go to Storm King. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna call my wife. <laughs> Pause the podcast. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, so that was good. I don't know. I've been, you know, dabbling on Instagram a little bit more, which I think is also kind of the topic of the pod. We'll get into later. Well, I sorry. Back to Storm King. Yeah, yeah, for just a second. Wasn't... Was there anything there of of note, like anything that was <laughs> inspiring to you of the sculpture? Well, the funny thing was, is it was almost so such a beautiful landscape and such a beautiful day that it was more about the nature than the sculpture. Oh, uh, yeah. Nature's well, the best I feel sculpture. like the cool thing, the cool thing about a sculpture park as opposed to like a typical museum is that nature obviously plays such a big role right. in like how you are appreciating or not. Yeah. The, like the work. Yeah. Or as in a typical museum, it's, you know, it is where it is and, and, you know, right. I mean, I guess there's like rotating 
exhibits and you can sort of see that, but like, yeah, the, the environment is much more controlled. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I mean, it's like, it's fun to see a, a huge sculpture in, in nature and kind of ha- see how it plays off the context around it. I mean, well, you know, I will say one of my favorite artists is Andy Goldsworthy. Okay. Uh, he's a nature artist. He does a bunch of the, Oh yeah. Like, uh, the one at storm King that he did was the stone wall. Okay. Um, I forget the name of the, the piece, but it's something like Andy's wall or something. And it's just yeah. a stone wall that zigzags in between all of the big trees. Yeah. Um, and then eventually it goes into the little pond and mm. then out the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know he's just famous for creating art out of nature. He'll do like, leaves so like line up leaves in a rainbow effect i mean this stuff also is you probably see it pretty often on instagram now um mm-hmm. if you go down that rabbit hole but he was kind of the first pioneer to do this he's he's not the one that makes the branches like create perfect circles yeah. no, he's okay like a, he does yeah. that he does cool. all kinds of stuff that's awesome ice stuff you know he just whatever the medium is in yeah. nature, he'll use it it makes me it makes me think that there's some sort of parallel between like outdoor sculptural work and industrial design work in that, I mean, I guess you're designing for a specific place um, when you're doing outdoor sculptural stuff. But, um, you know, when it comes to like industrial design, you kind of create an object and you put it out into the world and then it kind of like finds a home and that person then takes the object and tries to place it like harmoniously within their, their home setting. Like it's always interesting to like find a product of yours in the wild yeah, and how, how somebody has integrated it into their life. I mean, I, I, I suppose that's like more true for like furniture designers but yeah, I think that's one thing I've actually been learning a little bit more of is, you know, especially when you do larger objects like furniture or lighting, a lot of it kind of depends on the context, right? Yeah. Like a lot of it's kind of informed by the space it's in. And I almost feel like, you know, when I'm presenting to clients and, and I, you know, I've typically, I feel like when you render stuff, it's usually just in a white background, yeah. present just the object and and you can critique it that way. But with furniture, you kind of need space. You kind of need an environment to see how it's actually going to look. Yeah. Um, and it could, you know, I think it's a little bit of a, a tough game because obviously you could play into a, an environment that it would never be in, you know, like some super modernist house where, you know, there's only like five people that could ever have that house. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It makes me think about like, some of the furniture that I really and furniture designers that I love at at the same times, sometimes their stuff feels like it's been built and designed for like a more like almost like a museum cafe setting rather than like a home setting. But I guess like, I guess if you are mass manufacturing like chairs, like somebody like Jasper Morrison, then people who are going to mass quantity purchase those kind of things are museums, hospitality, yeah. whatever. But like, well, Jas- Jasper does a great job because his objects are so mundane mm. that they can fit in a, into a many environments. Yeah. But you think about people like Karim Rashid where they're, they're, Ob- there are objects that are very emotional yeah and those may not fit into every environment you know yeah um, yeah it's i don't know it's it's interesting i mean you're you're getting more into this world than than i am into the furniture design world yeah it's just like yeah like i wonder what the best setting to like even get in the mode of a furniture design is because i feel like you can sort of assess things in the studio but it doesn't that's not quite where that it's going to live. Yeah. You know, I guess it just depends on what market and there's probably multiple, multiple markets that furniture designers sell into. Yeah. And you can also tell that story too. It's like, I envision this object living in this environment and that's kind of the, the whole story behind it. Yeah. Um, anyway, total aside, 
kind of kind of rolls into design news i guess yeah. uh i thought it, this was kind of fun uh and you know we talk about gantry a little bit on the pod but um they released a bunch of new lamps with a bunch of new designers or some previous design i think but um i haven't even looked at them yet this is the first time looking at them uh but you know we have some people from that we know chris granberg obviously mm-hmm. um which chris had done his lamp and it, it's it's almost like a bunch of cubes stacked on top of each other it kind of looks yeah. like tetris yeah um and this was like a concept on his like Instagram, cr- right? cr- yeah chris is i find like chris and his engagement with instagram like so interesting and captivating because he kind of got into it like just a couple years ago and started going down like i feel like he refined his key shot abilities through instagram and like you know he went out he used to work for care machine then he moved out to la and he started his, his own studio and I feel like that happened. There was like a brief amount of time where he was living there before the pandemic. And then, you know, if you're trying to like bo- boost your name as like a, a an individual studio head, like how do you do that? And I feel like he came from the Karim Rashid world where like that's a lot about like connections and, and, and like parties yeah. and, you know, studio parties and things like that. But like... Chris embraced Instagram and embraced Keyshot and getting to know Keyshot. He was already very good at SolidWorks. He had been doing like some rendering, but I think he's his rendering skills have gotten like really, really good. But he's just like, he was just putting out a lot of conceptual work that was getting picked up and, you know, by various Instagram things. Like he was doing, obviously the render weeklies. I think there's like, there's also like color weekly and you know, other, other Instagram yeah, handles. Right. And I feel like he, he gained, I mean, I feel like he gained a lot of attention through that, but he had already done a set of lights through Gantry, but I'm curious how this set will do for him because I feel like he's, he's kind of like built up an audience now through Instagram that have seen like, these really awesome concepts that he's worked out yeah. through there. And, um, yeah, I, uh, but yeah, I, like when I first saw this concept that he posted, I was, Im- it's just one of those immediate, like, Oh my God, that's so cool. And also like, why did nobody else think it? It's like the Love perf- a good cube, you that know? perfect, yeah. that, that like, I think that's what every designer hopes for. A good cube, a perfect cube. No, just like the the thing. Why didn't I think of that moment? Yeah, Yeah, the thing that everybody is jealous of because they're like, "Oh, come on, it was right there." Yeah, Um, yeah. There's some there's some fun other ones. I like this one, Hula Table Light by Felix. uh, Yeah, Potinger. Potinger. That's nice. I like because it shines up and down at the same time. Get the nice gradient effect going on. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I know. I thought that was just a noteworthy thing. It's fun to kind of see the the new lights. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's just an interesting company. You know, obviously, we talk about like m- new ways of manufacturing and new technologies, and like people in the space that are changing the game. I mean, obviously, you have you know the, the iconic lighting companies and furniture companies, um, but it's just fun to kind of see these up and coming companies. Also, like Dim's Home, are you familiar with that mm-hmm. brand? I feel like that's another kind of brand that's changing the game a little bit with just how they approach design and social media and kind of the new, the new age of furniture. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like these companies are taking the blueprint from past furniture manufacturers in like engaging the newest like class crop of right. up and coming industrial yeah, yeah. designers because, you know, especially for Gantry, like they're selling sort of a a new manufacturing technology that like, you know, can enable this kind of, um, these kind of collaborations with, with up and coming designers and, you know, just like enables a new type of lighting, I guess. I mean, as compared to like, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just low. There's no tooling, obviously. Yeah. Um, low, lower risk. You yeah. Know, lower risk for the company. But it's... I mean, there's still some risk, obviously. There's I think it is showing the potential of a technology that I'm, like, excited about where it can lead in terms of, like, the entry level for up-and-coming designers to, like, get things produced and, um, yeah, like, this sort of, like, on-demand kind of way. But, yeah, I don't know. I just, like... I mean, it's... You know, I think designers do have kind of this role, which is to, to like make new technologies, new innovations, exciting and accessible mm-hmm. for the masses. Yeah. Because otherwise, like it's people just, just, just the don't latch on to yeah. it, or the engineers just, yeah. like, you know, um, for sure. I think also, you know, this this kind of rolls into our topic, which is, I, I think we wanted to talk about like social media and how it's changed over the years and like where it's going and especially how designers can use it. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious how much it's changed in the past couple of years. Um, You know, obviously Meta has, you know, TikTok came about, Meta's kind of changed Instagram quite a bit to compete. Um, You know, we're moving into this era of algorithmic content Mm. and less who you follow yeah you know um and i know it's interesting i mean i i think i watched a recent interview with mark zuckerberg where he talks about it and how a lot of the engagement has moved off of just your feed and more to messaging Mm. so people are just messaging back and forth more kind of close knit groups and the feed has now become almost like just an entertainment place, right? Mm. I mean, I don't know how you feel about Instagram or, or TikTok, but like, well, have you, are you on TikTok? No. <laughs> I I had a TikTok for a minute, but I but I stopped using it. it feel, I feel like TikTok melts my brain, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There, There's just like something about it that didn't really like, strike a chord with me i i actually like got to twitter kind of late in the game but i really kind of enjoy twitter yeah like as as sort of a place of like entertainment because i feel like twitter is like uh news and journalists like talking and clapping back at each other <laughs> and like you're sort of like twitter is definitely like people just dunking on each other you're and just arguing a lot. like uh, yeah i feel like twitter is this place where journalists like both break news and also debate news in real time yeah which is really interesting um so like i yeah i kind of like i like it for that but yeah i didn't i don't know i didn't really get into the tiktok thing as much I mean, I've, de- I've picked Twitter back up. I actually, ha- I think I was on Twitter back in like, I don't know, 2011 or something. Yeah. Um, and I used it pretty frequently back then. And I don't even remember what I was using it for, but it was, I think it was just like a feed of like yeah. content. Um, but yeah, I think especially with Web3, I mean, we talked about that last episode. Twitter is the place for all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually found that really interesting uh, was when I was working on NFTs and posting about it, um, I would post on Instagram. And of course, like we said, it was pretty controversial. Some people hated it. Some people loved it, but whatever. Uh, There wasn't as much interest on Instagram as there was on Twitter. Twitter Mm -hmm. seemed like the place for all that. Um, And what was really interesting is I started to see other really big name creators uh, post all their NFT stuff, like all their work and what they were doing on Twitter mm-hmm. and not on Instagram. Hmm. I think there was, um, I wish I don't, I don't remember, uh, this, Oh, burnt toast. Are you familiar with this? This artist, uh, they are an illustrator and they just do these really kind of whimsical drawings. Um, and I don't know, has probably like 300,000 followers on Instagram, something like that. Um, had, I had been following them for like, a good while just because I think they do great work and burnt toast did this NFT project called doodles, which is like 
one of the character projects mm-hmm. um and it blew up and it's like a really big project really pretty famous now um and he, he they never shared it on instagram only mm. like you know six months after the project was finished it was yeah. like oh hey i did this project huh uh, i don't know if that was just the pressure from nfts being controversial on instagram or if like uh or if it just is like there really isn't that value on instagram anymore at least for nfts i don't know yeah one thing that's interesting did you know you can post nfts on instagram now you can what does that mean it means that uh you can log in with your uh wallet your crypto wallet oh and connect and and verify that you own this image on nft on instagram huh Um, yeah i mean what is what is like meta's investment in sort of like web3 and nft well this is kind of i you know last episode i feel like we could have gone on for another two hours but you know (laughs) i saw the the battery your battery power was getting low james so i (laughs) yeah um and we didn't even get to touch on kind of the metaverse quote unquote right and i wanted to touch on this because i think this is like a it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because it's just become this buzzword. Um, the metaverse. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of people see the metaverse and think, oh, you know, like Sims or 3D worlds or whatever, or like online stuff. And I, I agree that that's kind of the, the medium it exists in. But if we really want to break it down, the metaverse is meta so it's like a step back right it's like a many many universes right Mm. um and the metaverse only works if you can travel from universe to universe to universe and take all your things with you Mm. and that's kind of where blockchain and web3 comes in right we're like oh if i own nft shoes i can go on to you know meta's you know facebook's instagram whatever i have these shoes or if i go over to like microsoft or apple or whatever it is um, those assets, those, I don't know, digital things you can carry with you mm. because if you don't have that, then it's just like Sims or it's just like second life, you know, okay. it's just like, well, it exists within this closed wall garden. And so it's not, it's not meta, you know, you can't pull back and say it's multi. I don't know that I know. Oh my gosh. See, now we're going to see, I can already see your eyes glaze over. I uh, well, no, I, I'm just like trying to, trying to figure this out because like w- what you're saying is, Oh God. Well, so, so <laughs> the, the, the proper terminology, which I was beating around the bush yeah. was it's called interoperability, okay. which is another one of these like, you know, new definitions of words, but essentially it means like interoperability is like the idea that things can work with other things, right? Like it just, I build a chair and it fits into this 3d world, but it also fits into this 3d world and this 3d world. Um, okay. So basically like, okay, let me see if I have this. Yeah. yeah, Let's hear it. I can already tell that like Nick is going to be making billions of dollars (laughs) because he's like taking the time to grasp these like new novel concepts about our future. And I'm going to be dead broke. No, like, like James, with, I'll have a room I'm going to have like a house. single I'm going to have like a single monocle that's going to like allow me to glimpse into into the metaverse. But um no, I mean uh so basically like what we're saying here is that users are going to be are going to be creating or like are users going to be creating or is meta going to be creating multiple metaverses for you to like take your things Right. So no, this is a good question. I think that's great. Uh, so meta has their own universe, their own 3d world. I think it's called horizons. Yeah. Um, and so in theory I could log in, you know, put my VR headset on, go into horizons and have like a, a house there, invite friends over. And you know, I could have my NFT chairs there. Yeah. Um, and then I could log out and go to, I don't know, uh, you know, a Microsoft, you know, 3D world and log in with my crypto wallet and my chairs would still be there. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and that's very different than what we have now. If you think about like Fortnite or something like that, like that's a 3D world. I mean, it's obviously a game, but it's also, um, you know, pretty popular. And it's like they have like didn't uh, didn't they have Astro World in Fortnite or something? Like oh, a concert? yeah. Um, you know, like if you buy an avatar in Fortnite, it stays in Fortnite. You can't bring that avatar to Minecraft or Roblox or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean. So basically what you're saying is like you're at home and you've put your crypto wallet, you've put your NFTs in your pocket and you've gotten in your car and you've taken it to the mall and you still have all of it on you. See, this is like what I'm imagining. Sounds, is like making it sound this, so strange. I'm, 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 I'm imagining like this mixed reality <laughs> world where some guy comes up to you in a trench coat and he's like, Hey kid, you want to check out my NFTs? <laughs> oh, I got so many board apes. You need a board ape? Like if a guy ever walks, walks up to you and do that, does that run? <laughs> Seems like a bad scenario. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just like, so I, I get it. Like these, the ideal for all of these things is that they will work in any of these like digital landscapes that we will be, that will be unlocked. But like, I think there's still this issue and I know we're going down this rabbit hole of like getting everybody interested in like VR, AR technology as it is today. Yeah. Like, Cause I feel like there needs to be a substantial leap to like get people invested in that world. Yeah. I also, I do want to take a step back and say like, I just wanted to explain what metaverse is yeah. at least to me, like with the definition of it. Cause I think it just gets thrown around like, Oh, it's 3d world, but I think it's 3d world plus ownership of assets. Right. Right. Um, but I do agree with you that like, it's not ready. Like we're yeah. still ways off from this. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, it's good to be like, it does feel like the inevitable. Right. And, and so like, um, it's good to know what's coming. Yeah. I guess and, I st- and the terminology and understand it. I actually still have, I'm probably more skeptical of like metaverse stuff than I am of just like normal ownership of digital assets. Like, you know, when I think about NFTs, it's like, oh, it could be a concert ticket or something like that. But I'm still, oh, yeah. Didn't- I'm, I feel like we got we got some comments on the Discord that were like some pretty interesting like episode discussion like mm-hmm. here's a, another way to think about NFTs. Yeah, I mean, I think we did miss the kind of the idea that it's like a concert ticket or a plane ticket, where it's just like this, you know, item that you can kind of redeem for an experience. That was another thing. I mean, we were talking about redeeming it for physical things, but you know, experiences as well. Mm. Yeah, uh, but. Yeah, I'm not fully convinced on kind of the 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 idea that you'll want to own like digital land. Definitely, I'm not convinced on digital land. Um, and, you know, I'm somewhat convinced of like inviting your friends to hang out in VR. I mean, I've done this on Gravity Sketch and also like just on, in games. It's like, you know, my dad and I will like put on the VR headset and, you know, he's in Florida and we'll play like ping pong together. <laughs> And it's pretty realistic, you know? Yeah. Um, that sounds like fun. So I do think there's there, there's, there's that thing that is going to become a more popular thing. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, instead of FaceTiming, let's hop in and play a game of ping pong. Right. Huh. Yeah. I. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I will say I'm, I'm excited for uh, legs. Legs are coming to VR. That's what Mark Zuckerberg announced too. <laughs> Legs are important. He wants James. to show off those gams. I need to sit in chairs. You can't sit in chairs without legs. <laughs> um, Zuckerberg's been working on those calf muscles. <laughs> yeah, he wants to show them off. I guess. <laughs> uh, the, I think uh, one thing I kind of wanted to pivot to is like, I got a lot of questions, and I don't think I've really answered it specifically of like why I archived my entire Instagram. Mm. I think we'd mentioned it or something and I talked about Yeah, because like I thought that you had done it because of the whole web three right. NFT ownership thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the beginning of this year I archived everything. 
And I don't know. I think there was definitely kind of this like, you know, if we think back, I would say like 2018, 2019 was like peak Instagram, especially like peak design Instagram. Um, you know, when the algorithm was really like favoring just, you know, showing your stuff. And then, you know, it was like a pretty popular thing. You could just post and people would see it. Um, and then as, as, as TikTok came around and more people left, um, and, you know, obviously pandemic, people just got tired of being online. It just like seemed to change quite a bit. Um, and I don't know, I just kind of got, was like, you know, is this something that is a value to my business? You know, is this something that I should be focusing a time on or is this like a distraction? Um, and I don't know, I just kind of wanted to try it and just see like, okay, let me just take a break, archive everything and see like where I go. Um, is there a quick way to archive things <laughs> on Instagram or no. was this manual <laughs> manual uh yeah a thousand posts man i think i had a thousand posts how long did it take uh, definitely like two or three hours maybe um just the same maybe. just yeah. repetitive yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i think i mean there's probably some software that you can like log into that does it for you but then you're like giving your password away to some right. you know, random software which is not a good thing to do um which you know is a whole other thing like this idea that I mean, I think what's really interesting and kind of what I regret is not uh, taking my followers to my own platform, right? Or not my own platform, but just like taking their emails, right? Like doing a newsletter Um, because social media pretty much, uh, you know, owns your followers, right? Like they, they own kind of the, the con- they have control over all that. So when they decide to change the algorithm or they decide to update something, you know, you can't, you can't reach the people that you once could. Um, and yeah, I wish I would have done a newsletter sooner. Mm. I mean, I still, <laughs> I still haven't really done a newsletter. I have a newsletter sign up on my site, but um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I wanted to see what would happen if I just focused on design work. And this also coincided with, my business class that I was taking. And so it was like a good time to kind of really evaluate and reflect on it um, and see, you know, how it affects my business and stuff. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I've, I've like, I've come back to it now. I've kind of unarchived some things that I think reflect the studio and where I want to take the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there's almost like maybe like, couple tactics that I that I want to try I think one is like this idea that it should just be much more casual I think Instagram really built up this idea that you almost have this gallery this very curated gallery of you know all your designs almost like a portfolio like a mini portfolio Um, and part of it now is like I wonder if we treat it more like posts as Instagram stories where it's just post whatever, you know, not a big deal. You mean like how it really started? Yeah. How the original, (laughs) yeah. When it's like Insta. It has basically come full circle. (laughs) Yeah. That is interesting. Cause it used to be like, well, it has Insta in the name. It's remember when, remember when later grams were a thing because it was supposed to be Insta. Yeah. yeah. Like you would post hashtag later gram if you were posting something after the fact, but originally it was all about like, take a photo of where you are, post it immediately. Like that was, that was the whole premise to the app. And then, and then it started becoming much more curated. Yeah. Well, especially as things like, tumblr fell off or like i don't know if people are still using tumblr the way that they used to i'm sure there's some diehards out but there. i feel like tumblr i feel like instagram kind of took over for tumblr in terms of like curation image curation um and like sort of like niche like certainly for some for some people like not personal accounts but like you know, some people were creating these sort of like niche image collections through Instagram. Yeah. Um, 
But then Instagram also added the aspect of like posting your own work, which I guess you could do with Tumblr, but Tumblr didn't really seem like the place for it. I never quite understood Tumblr. <laughs> I mean, I only use Tumblr as a uh, hosting site because it's free. Yeah. And you can add custom domain in. So it's like pretty much a way to build a free website. Right. Um, no strings attached, except for the fact that you get to kind of learn how to like hack the system and code and yeah, yeah. code it in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm not here to like complain about the algorithm. I think, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, but it is really interesting to me how, you know, I'm kind of coming back and maybe trying to post more now and to see I'll post, you know, one thing one day, it gets like 50 likes and I'll post something the next day and it gets 5,000. The dynamic of that is really interesting, mm -hmm. right? Cause it's much, just it's much more controlled around the algorithm than it is around how many followers you have. Yeah. Or maybe the, the 50 like post is just crappy content. <laughs> that too. I, <laughs> I will say, that, yeah, that's why I don't want to blame the algorithm, right? It's cause it's like, well, yeah, maybe it's, it's just, it, I mean, unless we have a metaverse, where you can compare, you can post it to the metaverse and then the real life. I know that that's not how it works. I'm being a total boomer, but, um, yeah, I, uh, no, I like, I began in inktober, like mostly because I was like, you know, I think we've talked about this before, but I think the thing that people, especially students might not understand about how professionals use Instagram is like some of it, use it, use it to create like a brand around themselves, right. but some people use it as an outlet because like their work life as a designer sometimes isn't so much about designing or like that first part of the process that we all love, right. um, which is like the sketching and the CAD and the rendering, like so much of the process is just like that collaboration between disciplines of, and, and sometimes, sometimes enriching, sometimes frustrating, like, right. you know, it's all of the things, but you know, sort of the, the games that you have to play in order to get something produced. But, you know, so like I was getting to that point where I was like, oh, I can, I can start to use Instagram again as sort of like this place to, have fun and experiment. Mm -hmm. And, and so I started Inktober, but you know, life <laughs> gets very busy very quickly and it's suddenly so hard and it. unexpectedly every that day. It's hard. It is very difficult. Um, so kudos to all those people that are, that have kept it up. But, um, but yeah, I did this one post that's just like a bunch of side views of sinks and it's like, it is literally distorting my view of reality how well it is doing on Instagram right now. Like the algorithm gods pl like play the cruelest tricks on you of like, this is the one. It's so weird, isn't it? And and, and it, it does not feel like, it's one of those, it's like, this is not my best work. Yeah. I don't think, like this is just me messing around and like, I was just like, oh, well, I'll post this. Actually, funny story about that. I had sketched out something and I showed it to Allison and she was like, Don't, that's that's not very good. <laughs> really? And so, and so I did a new sketch okay. and that's what I posted. And now I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> Maybe Allison called up Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Give it a boost. <laughs> um, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. Like I w I do want to, I do want Instagram to just be like a place to have to like fun with imagery yeah. and like experiment and tell like, you know, tell like very true, just like raw stories, I guess. But it also gets to this thing that I, I feel like when we're talking about the AI conversation and generative design, like, I kind of feel like the way that designers and people with hard skills can sort of stay relevant in a way is through the performance of their skill yeah, and through social media, because I feel like performing your skill is still something that's like very captivating to people. Yeah. Like, 
watching AI generate a bunch of images like is pretty entertaining, but also watching a human being do is something from scratch yeah. is is mesmerizing. Right. Um like I, I don't know if you saw recently uh this this like famous illustrator who just passed away. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't what, know their name. What, I'm I'm gonna look it up because okay. I don't wanna mess it up. But um he just like he was one of these people that it it's hard to understand how somebody can just go take ink directly to paper and create these like monumental illustrations that were just like oh yeah um kim jung ji okay um what was he known for he was he was an illustrator but he would like just famous illustrations he would he would do these sort of like monumental illustrations just like very very complex and it mm. seemed like he was going directly from like his mind like onto the page oh that's insane yeah, you know yeah. and and just like master of perspective master of composition like that's gonna that's gonna be mesmerizing forever right. to watch that kind of thing happen and and that's where i think like people are always going to have that craving. So it, it makes me wonder, you know, like how that exists alongside AI. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I, I think, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. Like I don't, no one's, I, I mean, I don't think the AI thing is interesting, especially when it first kind of came about because it was this kind of magic trick you could pull. Right. Right. I think now people are kind of, uh, you know, smart to it and they maybe almost discredit it now a yeah. little bit, a little bit like, Oh, you post an AI thing. Like, cool. Anyone can do that, which is an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Um, well, cause it has a certain aesthetic right, right now, but I, it makes me wonder how long it is until it's indistinguishable. Yeah. Or, I mean, or whether it ever will be. I mean, I think this is what, this goes back to our AI conversation where it's like, it's, it's that story. People want that story about the object. I mean, you could create a really compelling object or a design with AI if it has a good story. Right. Um, but if it's just like a, a pretty chair, it's like, mm, you know, yeah, cool. But, um, I was going to say the, when you talk about like professionals using Instagram, you know, obviously I'm trying to use it, you know, to build my brand, personal brand. I've always done that. Um, is kind of like an extension of my business. And especially coming into it now with a much more clear vision of my business after the kind of the pivot and the rebrand is I think, and I've always thought this too, I think Instagram is a way to remind people that you exist. <laughs> it's almost le- it's less about like, uh, you know, showing your work and more about like, Oh, Hey, I'm a designer. And you know, w- whenever you're at work thinking of designers, make sure you think about me. Right. Um, that's th- interesting. You know, cause that's, it's one thing that I found like over, you know, the past couple of years as I've just decided to focus on design work, it's like when you don't post online, you know, you just don't get inquiries, right? You don't get people reaching out. And of course there's many other ways to network and connect and you know, obviously the podcast has been a great outlet for networking and connection um, or just like group chats on discord and things like that. Just the old fashioned ways. Uh, but there is this, you know, big advantage of being on top of someone's mind. Um, totally online. You know, what's frustratingly still effective is like real life mailers. What? Like really? when you get when you get mail like catalogs from different companies, like I mean, hey, I exist. Yeah, yeah. Pretty. I mean, it's pretty effective because like you have to like you have to look at it as you're throwing it in the recycling bin. Like, <laughs> but I mean, sometimes the catalogs are pretty nice. Um, I've actually gotten back into like buying magazines. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I feel like this is such like. <laughs> Oh my God. I just, I just heard myself say that. And I'm like, I am such a, like 
a f- we lost all a the Gen cliche. Z. I'm such all like the Gen a, Z listeners have I'm such a off the Brooklyn pod. cliche of like, oh, I just got back into like a Polaroid film. You Actually, know, Polaroid's coming back, man. Yeah, it is coming back, and they have got speakers that are pretty cool looking. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I just I don't know. It's it is nice, like the. I do still feel like I heard somebody saying this about the internet recently. I forget where I heard it, but they were like the internet. Now it used to be like many, many websites that like you would go on and visit. Now it's like four. Right. And, and like, but then there's like, everybody has their own little like micro site within that. Yeah. But, um, but it just like things appearing on Instagram, it all feels like the same gallery in a way in terms of just like there's the Instagram background backdrop, which everything is on. And like that has a purpose just like on Amazon, you know, on Amazon, like you can't have like, yeah, like photography that's it's gotta be on a white in background. a setting. It's got to be on a white background. Mm-hmm. And so like, there's all the, there's just like this richness that's missing. There is, it's interesting because we do have these like unspoken rules about social media, like these, these norms that you kind of have to follow if you want to be seen. And I think like, obviously the newest norm is doing TikToks or reels where you kind of do this short form video content. Like if you want to, if you want to get your work seen, you kind of like have to do it. Yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot, especially a lot of designers are very averse to that. Right. Just because we've done, well, one video content's like more time consuming, more involved. And then also we just make a lot of still images. So it's just like natural to be like post a still image and not a video. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And it's like, how much do you want to just like constantly be setting up to document to like, f- yeah, like video document what you're doing Cause like vlogging for instance was a format that was popular for a while, but just like totally unsustainable. Yeah. And like, you know, I feel like so many people just got like burnt out on doing that unless you like build a team to do that. And then it just doesn't, it doesn't feel as authentic or as like meaningful as like, what it should be, which is like a video diary of yeah. who you are. I, I don't know. Well, this is, this is why I think oh, I, we're sorry. moving, we're moving back to casual content again. Yeah. It's because I think even the other day I, I posted a video of just some 3d prints. So, you know, in old Instagram, you would have taken a photo of 3d right. prints and just posted that. Yeah. And you know, this new video was just me, you know, picking them up and moving them. You know I mean? They were stacking chairs, but it's just like, you know, bare minimum of a video. Um, And so I don't even know if it's like the, the, the content, like, I don't think you need to change the actual content itself. I think you just have to flip from photo to video on your (laughs) camera roll, right? Or your camera. Yeah. Um, And just post more casually. I don't know. Anyways, that's, that's kind of like my, thought prospect process behind kind of the new wave of social media. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's just very different because like, like I said, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and obviously TikTok, they're just moving from this, Hey, I follow my friends to a Netflix, you know, it's like, this is entertainment. This is algorithmically fed to people that follow you or don't follow you. It doesn't really matter. It's just like, Let's get people on this platform. Yeah. Um, which is a whole other, you know, we could go down there. <laughs> totally. You know, a little bit of a dark rabbit hole. But, uh, um, I will, I will say w- one other thing and yeah, I, and I don't mean to like potentially broaden this topic because I think we have some questions that we want to get to, but I was recently thinking that like, and I've heard a lot of people like, you know, Mr. Beast, like just talking about YouTube and how he like, still loves YouTube and that's his, that's always going to be his primary. Mm -hmm. And I actually like, I think YouTube is, is super interesting because like, especially as somebody who, uh, who like, uh, takes in a lot of music, 
it's actually like one of the more interesting social media. Would you consider YouTube social media? I guess so. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's in, it's in a, it's, it's kind of in tangential. this like gray zone. Yeah. Cause there's, cause there's all sorts of production values on, on YouTube. There's algorithms. But I feel like as opposed to like being on Spotify or even like being on Bandcamp where like musicians are uploading music, it's like YouTube still feels like this very free space where people can like, like I can look up any song but I can also like find like crazy remixes that don't exist anywhere else. Like it's kind of absorbed a lot of like the blog mm. music culture that was happening mm -hmm. in like the early 2010s. Yeah. But it's just like, I don't know. And like people are like re-editing movies on like YouTube. They're well, taking movies and doing re-edits. That That's and interesting. Like there's, there's just, there's so much exploration that's done on YouTube in like really interesting creative ways. But then there's also like these creators who have just like come up from nothing and become like household names like MKBHD and, and things like that. Yeah. But, but it's just like, there seems, there just seems to be like this creative freedom that still exists within YouTube. And I think like, I, I don't know. There's, I don't know where that thought is going really, but just that it's, I think it's one of the more interesting social media platforms in that way. Yeah. I think YouTube's pretty untapped in terms of industrial design. Obviously you have a few people on there. Like I just think about like Morna or like John Mariello with design theory. Like, you know, there is kind of this educational side of yeah. design YouTube or Sam does design, right? Where it's more teaching uh, tutorials and like theory. I think the big gap in design YouTube is no one's doing vlog design YouTube. Hmm. Um, no one's just like, and this is, I've always thought about this as like, if I did YouTube, it would be like vlog YouTube. Yeah. Be like, this is what I'm working on. This is the project I'm doing. You know, follow me on this journey. Um, which I think could broaden out to, you know, a wider audience. I think many people would kind of enjoy that kind of content. Yeah. Um, but of course, this goes back to my point at the very beginning. This topic was like, is social media still worth it? Like is, you know, all this time spent producing content still, you know, is, is it distracting from the design process? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I've just kind of landed on like, as long as I keep it casual and less involved, uh, I think it's still pretty yeah, uh, convenient and efficient. Of course, I have, you've like spurred one more thought. Oh, keep going, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I I, feel like it's interesting because I noticed a couple years ago, there's like, there, there's there been this sort of split in terms of how, like, how media is produced, like social media. And I feel like there is the ultra curated, ultra edited. Yeah. But then there's also like you, I, I think I've mentioned this on the pod before, but like slow TV in, Nor in like Norway is like hugely popular. What is slow TV? Which is slow TV is like they literally mount a camera onto either like a ship ferry or like a train. And it's just like eight hours oh my of continuous, <laughs> you know, and they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's actually like really beautiful to watch. Like I like we've had people over and I'll just put on like the fairy slow TV and then put on some music and it's just like this perfect. Oh, that's cool. Like combination. It's like, a background. It's like yeah. almost like a screensaver. Yeah. It's just like, it's just something to like look at and it's, I don't I, think you've told me this. this really? Is cool. yeah, yeah. And, and so like, that's where I almost think like it was really fun when like Reed and I were doing that, um, water, uh, like, the water planter or yeah, water or can watering can, uh, project where we would just like once a week, we would put a camera overhead and just like record our right. brainstorm. And like, there was no editing going into that. Just like with this, like, and, and I just like, I, I wonder if like, that's, that's also a part of this sort of like casual conversation or like the more casual approach to social yeah. media of just like, 
fly on the wall. I think, like, yeah, that's good. I think that's a great tech. I mean, the thing, the thing with all this is like the reason I feel like this is a valuable tactic now is like, since the algorithm has so much more weight than it used to, why risk all that effort creating this super curated thing if it may not pay off, right? Yeah. If you can get the same payoff with, you know, a random sync sketch, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. All right. We should get to these questions, but yeah. Uh, all right. So, we have a question here from, I'm going to answer this one first, uh, from Rajat. They say, hey, I'm into industrial design and did my master's. It's really great to get, it's really getting tough to get it into hardcore industrial design. When you search product design, it's mostly digital products and they all look for UX, UI designers with digital experience. Any tips for industrial designers to get into the industry? Um, and I think specifically, you know, one, you know, one part of this question is like when you search for an, for product design you just get a bunch of ui ux yeah which you know we've known for a while and i think we have lost that battle there's no sense in <laughs> trying to save product design yeah um, i think it's gone oh yeah um no i think this brings up a uh, like a tactic that i used and unfortunately like didn't get to really use like the resource fully that i had that i had gained through this exercise but um Basically, when I when we were looking to move out to LA, um, the f the way that I figured out the the LA design scene was to like search like industrial designer and find the people who are working in LA as industrial designers, and then I just went down a rabbit hole of like where are they working, where uh, did they work last, interesting, like and and I just like basically went through like every Los Angeles industrial designer and like where they were working or where they had worked previously in order to like map out the scene to, to understand it fully. Uh, which like led me to discover like, Oh, I didn't know that company was headquartered there. Like, mm. cause you wouldn't know if you're just looking at job boards. Right. Cause like, you know, and so like, the idea there was when, once I got out to LA, like, unfortunately it's sort of the pandemic got in the way of this. I, I was just going to start like reaching out to people to like grab coffee or grab drinks or right. whatever. Well, that, that also brings up something that I am reminded of is I don't know if we did this before we took a break from the podcast, but on Discord, we crowdsourced an industrial design map yeah. of the world. So every <laughs> yeah, everyone on Discord plugged in the companies in their city that hired industrial designers. So you know, there's like 500 companies on this map, um, and you know, you can just log into your city and say, "Oh, I didn't know they were looking in there." Like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think part of it's like just kind of yeah just finding these like niche because there's the thing is we think about the big companies like smart design frog or whoever and we don't think about the people or the companies in like you know alabama or like you know nebraska yeah which do need designers too you know yeah. there, there are manufacturing plants there and design things going on yeah i think there's i think there's a bunch of like corporations in the midwest yeah that i just like completely didn't even like think to apply to or look at, but obviously there's all the furniture manufacturers out there like Herman Miller and Steelcase. But then there's like places like Newell Brands and there's 3M. Yeah, and like Rubbermaid. I think are they are they in North Carolina? I think they actually have a couple. Yeah, <laughs> it was also I I was talking about this recently with somebody. I find it funny. I think like. I mean, obviously, like, Cincinnati has sort of, like, the most widespread connection network, but I feel like there are schools that have very specific connections, and for whatever reason, maybe it's an alumni thing, but I remember at, like, Virginia Tech, it was, like, um, TTI, like the, mm. like, the tool group. Right, that's, like, the Southern. Yeah, that's we had the that Southern connect. Yeah. But then, like, when we were out in Purdue, everybody was talking about Delta Fawcett. Oh. which was a company that I didn't really know much about. Right. But now I like see their ads and stuff and I'm like, Oh yeah, like cool. But 
I didn't, re- I didn't know anything about Delta faucet, like, right. but I'm sure like, seems like a cool place to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when I was at lifetime, somebody reached out to me from, I think it was Kohler yeah. or something. I think they're up there too. And right? I was talking to somebody. Sheboygan. Is that what yeah. I think I was talking to somebody at lifetime about it and they're like, Oh, I've actually heard they're like, a really cool place to work. Like I had, they, I had a friend that worked there. Yeah. They like, they do really good sort of like ID Emmy collaborative, like really interesting, uh, um, work. And so like, yeah, I just, I, I do, I wish that I had known about those kind of companies yeah. and that's like kind of what spurred on the, the crowdsourcing was just like, I didn't know about them. And I was talking to all these students, um, because of my post about like, hey, if you want some help, let me know. Here's my email. And I was talking to people. And I was like, you don't know this company? What about this one? <laughs> like, And like, I know about them now, but I didn't know about them then. And of course, like you want to try and round out the like the resources of, of people that don't like yeah. don't know where to look. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big thing, too. It's like if you if you're truly passionate about industrial design and you want an industrial design job, you have to, you know, possibly sacrifice the the cool city to live in or the cool f- consultancy to work at, and yeah. you know, go to you know the the lesser known brand or the lesser known city. Yeah, um, I mean that's how I you know started out. Um, Refine your chops and post on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> post on. We wouldn't we wouldn't have known each other if if not for that. We didn't even get to TikTok. I mean, TikTok design seems a whole other thing. Oh but, yeah. Well, <laughs> save that for another day. Another day. Um, all right, we got a uh, one more question. Sound good? Yep. All right. This one comes from I believe Johan. Uh, sorry if that's not your name or not how you pronounce it, <laughs> but I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, greetings from Sweden. Very happy to have your podcast on again. I'm working as a design engineer, but have always had an interest in the design aspect of product development. It's always been a point of view. It's always been like my point of view don't match with the mechanical engineers I work with. But at the same time, I don't have the experience to work as an industrial designer, but I sort of like the mix in between. Based on your work experience and the people you have worked with, in what type of project would someone with a mixed experience slash interest in mechanical industrial design create most value? Thanks for the great podcast, Johan. Mm. Um, that's kind of interesting. So like someone who's both in the engineering and has more of a design interest, like what industry could they kind of flex both of those muscles? In my experience, I think, design engineers are often the most useful like in in a startup setting mm, interesting. um th- that's one that's one route because i think the startup setting like obviously a startup wants to have personnel that can wear multiple hats and if you have interest in industrial design and engineering like it sounds like you're somebody that just wants to like dig into something right and and you know and so like I think that that's sort of like what startups, the type of person that a startup craves. Um, the other route is like working for a manufacturer or like working for somebody like who has, they have in-house design, but also like in-house manufacturing. And so like, you're also somebody who's like wanting to get down to like the factory floor, like, you're like to me the design engineers that i've met are always just trying to get their hands dirty yeah and so like yeah like if you're working for the manufacturer and you can also be the liaison for like for the engineers and for the design for the designers uh that that's like been my experience with design engineers and like where they kind of fit that's interesting yeah i mean i i would say maybe you probably have a bit more experience in that kind of field, obviously just working for more companies. I mean, I was thinking of products where you, you probably could get by with like a, a smaller team, maybe like yeah. kind of what you're saying with a startup. I mean, I think about like maybe kitchen wares or something where, you know, there's probably like some engineering involved in like some, you know, 
appliance or, or small kitchen item. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing with kitchen wares is like, <clears throat> I, I would hesitate to recommend things that might require like intense design, like and surfacing, mm. like as kitchen wares gets so ergonomic That's that true. I feel like you have to kind of have a grasp of like a certain aesthetic as well as like a way of achieving that aesthetic. That's difficult to come in if you just have an appreciation for design. Yeah. So I think there, like maybe there's, there's some other industry that. Yeah. I was trying to like think of like OXO. It just feels like OXO is kind of like a right more engineery product. Yeah. And I think but that, the, I think OXO has like, obviously they have great industrial science. Right. And, and you know, they use smart, smart design mm-hmm. for a lot of their work. But I think that they do, I feel like I've even seen OXO post for design engineering types Mm. because like, I think the engineering load is not as intense as like some other industries. And so, yeah, like a design engineer might be all you need to like validate what you're trying to do. Yeah. Once you're manufacturing. Because I think like the opposite of that would be to go work as an engineer for something that would would be way too involved like i think of like like automotive like i don't you know there, i guess there's probably some design engineer jobs at automotive but like there's definitely when you get into automotive it's like oh yeah heavy yeah. engineering going on there um, i it, this does remind me of a conversation that i had with with an engineer yesterday and we were talking about like she was starting to make some furniture like at home. Oh wow. Okay. And, but she was kind of like asking just about like design resources and like aesthetics and things like that. And one of the, one of the things that I said to her, and I wonder if you feel similarly, like, I think obviously some people have like a grasp on aesthetics and can push things in ways that other people might not see innately. But I also think that aesthetics is just like understanding, like getting to a solution that looks good sometimes is just about creating enough like to, in order to assess like, oh, that doesn't feel right. That feels better. Right. Like it's, I don't feel like there's any secret to like, Oh, this is, this is just, this thing is going to make it aesthetic. Yeah. Like it is just literally like anything else. And I'm sure engineers are very familiar with just like trial and error, but yeah. like, like, you know, obviously there's like maybe industrial, like people like us are more aware of like the trends and the current trends. But if you're just trying to like put together some basic pieces of furniture it can be just as simple as like creating scale models to just like progressively like tweak things and right. just does this feel right and yeah. getting that feeling may take some time but like there's intuition there that's involved there is um but but i also think that like intuition has to, like also just comes from experience yeah um so it's a little bit of both yeah. It's kind of chicken and egg, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I do that all the time, especially in VR, because it's so easy to just like do a chair and then like 10 different versions that have just a different thickness of a leg. Yeah. And then you stand there and you're like, okay, this is the right one. Yeah. Um, totally. And why is it the right one? Who knows? That's how, <laughs> that's how I feel in my heart, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for sending that question in. Also, if you're listening and you have a question, feel free to shoot us an email, mydetailspodcast at gmail.com. Um, you know, we're coming up on our hundredth episode. So if you guys have, uh, good memories of the pod or maybe a favorite episode or a favorite moment you want to share, uh, send it in as well. And we probably can put that on the, the episode. Um, so yeah. Uh, good pod. Good pod. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, as always, I'm Nick. I'm James. Peace. Later.